So this is Physio Chapter 7, and we are starting the nervous system. So Chapter 7 is talking about or discussing nerve cells and electrical signaling. And so this does require you to remember some of your um, anatomy. And so if you want to review um, anatomy nervous system, uh, you can check out chapter 13 in the anatomy videos. This will help you review central nervous system, peripheral nervous system. Um, it will help you review uh, central nervous system as brain and spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system begins at receptors and they respond to specific stimuli. And if there's enough stimulus, it will form an action potential. And we will discuss how that occurs in the next couple of chapters. Uh, it will go um, and propagate along the afferent axon into the central nervous system. Uh, in the brain and spinal spinal cord, you have interneurons that can communicate between one another. And if a neuron generates an action potential that propagates out of the central nervous system along an efferent axon, uh, if it's involving the skeletal muscles, it's the somatic nervous system. If it's involving heart muscle, smooth muscle, or glands, uh, then it's the autonomic nervous system. And I believe chapter 11 goes into sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Um, so understand the basic structure and um, kind of overall view of the nervous system begins at receptors uh, that respond to specific stimuli. Review this, this is the sensory afferent in to the central nervous system and what types of action potentials come out are more motor efferent, either somatic, which is strictly skeletal muscle or autonomic, which is smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. All of these are termed effectors. So um, again, review these slides, um, spend time reading through them and understanding, review uh, the nervous system chapter 13 of anatomy if you want to go over neurons, the basic cells, and neuroglial cells, which are the support cells of the nervous system. There are two different types of glial cells in the peripheral nervous system and four in the central nervous system and review each function of them. Now, the neuron is the basic cell of the nervous system. And uh, we are gonna talk about these parts because I'm gonna refer to them after this. Um, so the soma is the cell body. So this kind of outlines the soma. And now off the soma or cell body, you have what are called dendrites, these long extensions. And they're really extensions of the cell body. They're so you can make many, 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 many um, connections. And so these dendrites provide avenues for other neurons to connect to one another um, and, and have more surface area than just the cell body. The axon hillock is where we're gonna talk about, has the highest uh, voltage gated sodium channels. And we'll talk about the purpose of that. Um, it's generally where the action potentials originate. Uh, and those action potentials or electrical currents will propagate along the axon all the way down to the axon terminals. Now you may notice that one axon will branch to numerous uh, axon terminals. So you can have this one axon branch, 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 and so on and so forth. So it can actually connect with multiple uh, neurons. Or if you might remember a motor unit um, back in anatomy, that was one motor neuron and it would branch um, to many, many muscle fibers and form 
synapses with many, many muscle fibers. And so what a synapse is, it's where an axon terminal um, has chemical communication with the post synaptic structure. And in this case, it's another neuron. So it's the postsynaptic neuron. But if we were talking about muscle cells, um, the postsynaptic, it would be a muscle fiber. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, this is the cell. <coughs> and really, we talk mostly about motor neurons and sensory neurons and interneurons. And so those are the basic neurons that we concern ourselves with uh, in this class. Um, pseudo unipolar, those are mostly the sensory neurons. Multipolar are the motor neurons. Interneurons can take on many shapes um, that are a little bit different. So functional classes of neurons, <coughs> excuse me, you have uh, sensory, going in, you have motor coming out, and then again, you have the interneurons. <coughs> okay. Um, myelin. Myelin is created around axons by the glial cells. And in the central nervous system, they are called oligodendrocytes. And in the peripheral nervous system, they are Schwann cells. Um, this myelination allows the action potential to propagate quickly um, down the axon without losing uh, ions um, and thus losing the uh, electrical stimulus. So the way that it's termed is it reduces leakage of ions across the membrane. And so the electrical signal and transmission is more efficient. Um, it insulates it. So the electrical signal stays in that axon. There's nothing that's going to leak out or disappear. And those ions aren't going to drift away. Uh, a synapse, that's the site of communi chemical communication between a neuron and another neuron or a neuron and an effector organ, again, which would be a skeletal muscle fiber, a uh, smooth muscle fiber, cardiac muscle fiber, or gland. Um, these neurotransmitters are created in the soma of the neuron. In the nucleus, there's transcription and translation of proteins, neurotransmitters or proteins. They are then finished up in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, sent to the Golgi apparatus, which packages the neurotransmitters in a synaptic vessel, and then sends that synaptic vessel down to the axon terminal. And that synaptic vessel will sit there with neurotransmitter until there's the signal to then exocytose that neurotransmitter. And that signal, um, is calcium. So calcium is a signaling molecule. And um, we're going to talk about the types of ion channels. So calcium is an ionic signaling molecule. And uh, when an electrical signal reaches the synaptic terminal, there's a change in voltage and it opens up voltage gated calcium channels. So calcium can come in and signals the exocytosis of the neurotransmitter. Um, and we'll talk about that more in length. So I talked about voltage-gated channels. Um, there are really three types of channels in neurons. One are leak channels. Now, leak channels are always open. Super important to understand. They're always open. They're throughout the neuron. And they help um, set the resting membrane potential. So we'll discuss that uh, in a little bit. Number two are ligand gated channels. Now a ligand again is anything that binds to a protein. And in this case, that anything is going to be a neurotransmitter. So neurotransmitters are the ligands. They'll bind to a ligand gated channel and that will open the channel and that will allow an ion in. Um, some of them are inhibitory. They can close channels as well. So um, uh, not all uh, 
stimulus are going to be excitatory and cause a, a depolarization and an action potential. Some actually make it harder to generate an action potential, and those are called inhibitory. Uh, ligand gated channels are on the dendrites and cell body or soma. Um, and these are the gated channels that start graded potentials that can then lead to action potentials. The third type I had talked um, about earlier is voltage gated channels. Now these open and close when there's a change of voltage. And um, so this is important with generating an action potential. You have voltage gated sodium channels and voltage gated calcium channels. Um, voltage gated sodium channels are mainly at the axon hillock, but are located throughout the axon as are the slow voltage gated um, potassium, sorry, potassium channels. Uh, and then again, at the axon terminal, you have voltage gated calcium channels. When the action potential reaches the axon terminal, there's a change in voltage because the action potential is a change in voltage and that will open up calcium voltage gated channels. Calcium comes into the axon terminal and that will signal the release of neurotransmitter when the action potential reaches the axon terminal. Okay, so let's talk about this resting membrane potential. Um, that's really potential energy for a neuron. And that's why it's called a resting membrane potential. And it is determined predominantly by potassium and sodium ions. Now, we talked about the inside of a neuron is more negative than the outside. Um, remember the inside of a neuron is negative 70 millivolts. And what that negative means is there's a lot of anions. Uh, and so there's negative 70 millivolts more anions in there. Um, all cells have a resting membrane potential. Um, neurons are negative 70 millivolts. So there's more anions inside than cations. So why do resting membrane potentials create an electrical current? Well, again, when you have a membrane and you separate the charges, Remember, there's more sodium out here and more anions in here, and here's the membrane. Obviously, they attract, right? So sodium wants to come in and they'll move if there's no membrane. So the separating, the membrane separates these charges, which is a potential energy if you are to open up that membrane, things are gonna move. And so by this membrane separating these charges, it's creating potential energy and we call it a membrane potential. Now, when the ions are allowed to move down their electrochemical gradient, they carry their charges with them, cations and anions, the plus or minus charges, and that creates the electrical current. Now, the strength of the uh, potential energy is going to depend on the amount of charge separation. So remember, more the bigger the concentration gradient for something, the more energy potential energy it has. Right? Um, the bigger the uh, difference. In voltage across a membrane equals more potential energy. So that is to say, if you have the inside of one cell is negative 30 millivolts and the inside of another cell is negative 70 millivolts, which one is going to have more potential energy? And hopefully you would say negative 70 because negative 70 is 70 millivolts away from zero. Negative 30 is only 30 millivolts away from zero. So negative 70 has a lot more potential energy to generate currents than a negative 30 um, would. Uh, 
Okay, so equilibrium potentials um, exist for each ion. And so I alluded to the electrochemical gradient for each ion. And that's taking into account the concentration gradient. So the ion's concentration gradient and the ion's electrical gradient. So which way is the ion gonna move electrically and chemically? Uh, and so those two factors help determine the resting membrane potential along with active transport So you have the sodium potassium pumps. They're pumping three sodium out of neuron and two potassium into the neuron. And this is active transport. Um, and I'll explain why three sodium are being pumped out and two potassium are being pumped in. But first we're gonna talk about the equilibrium constant of each um, ion. Now, the equilibrium of each ion, this is the direction the ions want to move. They want to move towards equilibrium. And an ion is in equilibrium when there's no net force. So what that really means is the chemical force or the concentration gradient for that ion has to equal the electrical gradient for that same ion and then it will be at equilibrium. Um, and so this is showing you for potassium here. Potassium has uh, more potassium inside than outside. And so potassium has a, right, a chemical gradient, concentration gradient to come out. But because it's negative 70 millivolts in here, it has a, electrical gradient to come in. And so what happens is the concentration gradient is bigger than the electrical gradient. And so more potassium is going to leave than are going to be drawn in. But when it's equal and opposite, meaning no more potassium wants to leave, um, that is actually when the inside of the cell is negative 97 millivolts. Now there's, a, um, there's an equation that you can mathematically figure out the e equilibrium potential for each uh, ion. Um, we're not gonna go through that equation, uh, but you will reach negative 94 millivolts. That is to say, potassium wants to keep leaving the cell past its resting membrane potential at negative 70. It will only stop coming out of the cell at negative 94 millivolts. So potassium has a chemical driving force to leave the cell because there's a high concentration of potassium inside versus out. But because the inside of the cell is negative, it has a pull to come back in and that's the electrical driving force. Um, the cell will eventually reach equilibrium when enough potassium leaves to bring the cell a little bit more negative than negative 70, it brings it down to negative 94 millivolts and that becomes the equilibrium um, potential for potassium when they're equal and opposite. Now, remember, if we start off and this is the resting membrane potential and potassium's equilibrium is negative 94, that's not that far off, right? Uh, let's do a little bit better math here. That's only a negative 24 millivolts away. So it's not a huge difference. Potassium's equilibrium potential is not vastly different than the uh, resting membrane potential. Sodium, on the other hand, has a lot of sodium out here, high concentration outside low concentration inside, has a huge concentration gradient driving it into the cell. Um, so as the sodium diffuses into the cell, the inside of the cell becomes more positive. And because it becomes more and more positive, it starts having an electrical 
drive to leave because it's too positive now inside the cell. And so at some point, it's gonna have an equal and opposite electrical drive out when the inside of the cell reaches positive 60 millivolts. Um, and so that's positive 60. And, and this is important because you, you need to understand um, this is zero millivolts. And this would be positive 60 millivolts up here. And then that's negative 70 millivolts. And that's negative 94 millivolts. And I'll make it even a little bit more dramatic here. Is that this is positive. And I'm putting positive 60 up here. And I'm going to put zero about here. I'm going to just completely start over so I can make a, it, it look a little bit more obvious to you. Here would be zero. Here would be negative 70. And here would be negative 94. So this is the equilibrium potential for potassium. This right here is the resting membrane potential. And here's the equilibrium for sodium. And so you can see that sodium has just this much bigger drive to move than say potassium. So only a little bit of potassium, this is only negative 24 millivolt difference there. So potassium doesn't have this huge difference uh, between the resting membrane potential and the equilibrium potential of potassium. But if you look at the difference here between the resting membrane potential and sodium, we're talking 70 plus 60. So you're gonna have 130 millivolt difference for sodium. That's a much bigger difference than potassium. That is to say, sodium has a much bigger drive to move than potassium. And so this shows you that more sodium will enter cell faster if allowed versus potassium. Or another way to say it is sodium has a greater drive to move into the cell than potassium has to leave the cell. What is that based on? Smaller drive for potassium, greater drive for sodium. That is why sodium is 25 times um, more likely to go into the cell than leave the cell. Therefore, potassium is much more open to coming and going than sodium. And when you look at these leak channels that we had talked about, remember leak channels are always open. and they are on cell body or soma of the neuron. And so what you're gonna find is these are potassium leak channels. And there are three times more potassium leak channels than there are sodium leak channels. Why? Because potassium doesn't have a huge drive to leave the cell. So you can have channels that are open all the time and potassium still doesn't have a giant uh, 
uh, need to leave the cell. Whereas sodium, on the other hand, you don't want to have too many leak channels because sodium has a really big drive to come into the cell. And so you have three times more leak channels for potassium than sodium. This gets the, um, the inside of the cell close to negative 70, but the, um, and you guys can read through this, the inflow zone, blah, 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 um, gets it to negative 70, um, but then gets it close, but not totally. Then you have active transport, the sodium potassium pump. So at that point, you have the resting membrane potential set at negative 70 millivolts because it's pumping three sodium out and two potassium in. Why does it need to pump out more sodium than potassium? Because again, more sodium wants to come in, has a bigger uh, drive to come in than potassium has to leave. Uh, and so the sodium potassium pump makes sure that it keeps pumping sodium out from what comes in from these leak channels and potassium in from what leaves through the leak channels. And that keeps it at a membrane potential of negative 70. Um, so you could read through this slide um, and it goes through setting the resting membrane potential at 70. Uh, this is kind of what I was showing you um, before and that, you know, a neuron's resting membrane potential is much closer to potassium than it is for sodium. Uh, and um, so again, sodium just has a bigger drive. So a neuron at rest, you're gonna have, you know, some sodium leaking in, but there's not many leak channels. You're gonna have um, potassium leaking out, but there's not a huge drive for it to leak out. And then you're gonna have continual active transport of sodium out and potassium in, keeping the resting membrane potential at negative 70. Um, now, membrane potentials can change when you open up that membrane in a new way. And this is where ligand gated channels and voltage gated channels come into play. The, uh, these channels are going to open and close in response to a stimuli. And when they open, they allow ions to move across the membrane. And when ions move, that is an electrical signal. And so we talked about voltage gated, ligand gated. We'll talk about mechanically gated when we get to special senses. But what happens is, um, if there's an initial stimulus that opens a ligand gated sodium channel, neurotransmitter binds and opens that sodium channel, a little bit of sodium is going to come in. So you'll see some sodium come in here. If the neurotransmitter gets broken down right away and the channel closes, and it doesn't get up to negative 55 millivolts, say it only hits maybe negative 60, it's just gonna die back down. But if there's enough neurotransmitter ligand binding to these ligand gated sodium channels and enough sodium comes in to depolarize it to negative 55, here's where the voltage gated sodium channels open. And this is where you see the greatest depolarization. Why is it called depolarization? Because when things are polarized, they're far apart. And so negative 70 is far apart from zero, but when sodium comes in, it gets closer to zero. So it's depolarizing it. When you bring it back down to negative 70, you're repolarizing. And when you go past the resting membrane potential of negative 70, you have hyper polarized it. So um, these are terms that we use when referring to the resting membrane potential or RMP um, and depolarization, it gets less negative. It gets closer to zero um, and above or repolarization gets more negative back towards the resting membrane potential and hyperpolarization is past.
resting memory and potential. Um, and so graded potentials are these small depolarizations, or it could be a small hyperpolarization if it is an inhibitory graded potential, meaning it's making it harder to form an action potential or inhibiting. Um, like I explained before, um, a graded potential is really due to its strength. That is to say, if there's a high concentration of neurotransmitter release, then you're gonna have a high concentration of ligand gated sodium channels open. And that's gonna be a higher depolarization. Uh, if it gets to negative, if it depolarizes to negative 55 millivolts, that's called threshold. And then that gen starts generating an action potential because now you have voltage gated sodium channels open. And that just allows sodium to flood in. and depolarize it up to positive 30 millivolts. That's an all or nothing thing. Once those voltage gated sodium channels open, it's going to form an action potential. So a lot of times it starts as a graded potential, it has to have enough sodium come in um, if it's excitatory to hit threshold to become an action potential. And so these graded potentials are said to be able to sum them together. And so what summing, and you guys can read this, um, they can sum together to increase or decrease in magnitude um, is that uh, you can add graded potentials to reach threshold. And threshold is the level of depolarization necessary to elicit an action potential, meaning it has to go from negative 70 millivolts to, I should say, up to negative 55 millivolts to reach threshold. Uh, that's for excitatory. Inhibitory, it means you're actually, so if that's negative 70 millivolts, you're actually bringing it down and making it harder because if negative 55 is up here, you're making it harder to depolarize. You need now more sodium or more ligand gated channels to open to get um, an action potential. So um, inhibitory does, does occur and we'll talk more about that in later chapters. Um, but most of this chapter, we're really focused on excitatory. So graded potentials, um, there's temporal summation. And what that means is it's the same stimulus repeating over time. That is to say, if I were to stimulate and then again, same one, and then again, same one, same one, and this is time, right? So I do this at one second and I do this at two seconds and three seconds, same stimulus, I'm just, doing it repeatedly over time. That is temporal summation. And that is to say, W, it's the same stimulus. I'm just doing it one time, two times, three times. If I do it close enough together, um, remember the neurotransmitter binds to the ion channel, allows sodium in, and then more neurotransmitters release and allows more sodium in, and it reaches enough sodium coming in to depolarize the inside of the cell to negative 55 millivolts, which is threshold, then now you have these voltage gated sodium channels open and then sodium just floods in. Uh, it could be spatial summation. So that's, that's in, in different spaces, so to, so to speak. So they're different stimuli. They're not the same stimuli, but they're at the same time. So they're applied at the same time. So we have stimulus W, but we also have stimulus X. Uh, 
And if we do W and X at the same time, you'll have enough sodium channels to open up to hit threshold and an action potential will then occur. Uh, if it's inhibitory, say Y is inhibitory, uh, then it's gonna cancel out, right? So what is an inhibitory? Inhibitory would be you either close potassium channels. Um, and so uh, potassium can't leave the cell uh, or, um, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. You open potassium channels or chloride channels, right? You open potassium channels, so potassium leaves cell right, to bring it closer to negative 94, which is its equilibrium constant, or chloride channels open, and chloride has a concentration gradient to go into the cell, thus making it more negative inside the cell. So those, those are the generally the two ways that hyperpolarization um, occurs. Those would be inhibitory graded potentials. Um, if, if enough depolarization occurs to go from negative 70 millivolts inside the cell up to negative 55 millivolts inside the cell, that equals threshold, and that causes an action potential. That's a large depolarization. That's due to those voltage-gated sodium channels opening. And those are mainly located again in the axon hillock. So that is where they say action potentials tend to be generated from because that's where the voltage gated sodium channels are. And so there's three phases of the action potential. You have the initial graded potential, so to speak. And that's really due to ligand gated channels. Uh, depolarize the cell, then now you have the voltage gated sodium channels open. When it hits positive 30, two things happen. Those voltage gated sodium channels close. So no more sodium can come in. And the slow voltage gated potassium channels open. And remember, potassium wants to leave cell. And so as the potassium leaves the cell, it becomes more negative again because potassium wants to come all the way down to negative 94 millivolts, which is the equilibrium constant for potassium. Um, so again, this is resting membrane potential. Now, because potassium wants to reach its equilibrium constant down here at negative 94 millivolts, you're going to have some hyperpolarization due to the fact that these potassium channels are slow to close. And that causes hyperpolarization. So here's the three phases. You have depolarization due to sodium coming in. You have repolarization due to sodium channels closing, uh, decrease in sodium permeability and the potassium channels opening, potassium leaves cell. Uh, and then hyperpolarization, you have potassium continues to leave because it wants to reach its equilibrium constant of negative 94 inside the cell. Um, voltage gated channels can be active and inactive. And um, so this has to do with the refractory period or the ability to generate a second action potential in a neuron. Um, initially, uh, if the gate is inactive, it's open. Um, if the voltage changes and these voltage gated sodium channels open, then sodium can come in and the gates open. Uh, at positive 30 millivolts, that gate's gonna close. 
and the channel closes. And so uh, you now have the gate active and nothing can go through. And, um, and so this has to do with an absolute refractory period. Meaning uh, no second action potential can occur. Because that gate's closed. So even if the channel's open, sodium still can't go through, gate's closed. Um, read through this. You can pause and read through all these steps because they keep saying kind of the same thing over and over again. But uh, when the voltage gated sodium channels open, more sodium enters, which then makes more sodium enter, which then goes as sodium tries to reach its equilibrium potential at positive 60, but at positive 30, two things happen, um, the gate becomes closed, right? And so you have a decrease, sodium can't come in anymore. And at that same time, slow voltage gated potassium channels open and potassium flows out and starts to repolarize the cell. Um, so neither sodium nor potassium ever reach their equilibrium potential, but they both try to get to their equilibrium potential. And again, sodium is gonna be a positive 60 and potassium is going to be a negative 94. Now, um, repolarization is due to potassium channels remain open and potassium still continues to leave because it wants to keep uh, leaving the cell till it's negative 94 millivolts. Um, eventually, potassium channels will close before it reaches negative 94 millivolts. And then the sodium potassium pump restores the membrane potential back to negative 70. So here is where the pump is actively transporting potassium back in to get it back here. Um, the idea of threshold is that minimum depolarization from 70 to negative 55, um, enough to then cause an action potential. Um, if, if you don't open enough voltage-gated channels, you can't get enough sodium in there and you can only get it to negative 60 or uh, negative 58, it's still not gonna be enough to hit threshold. You have to depolarize it all the way up to negative 55 to get those voltage-gated sodium channels to open. Um, if it's super threshold and it goes from negative 70 straight to uh, say negative 20, that would be like a super threshold stimulus. It's gonna cause the same action potential as it would if it made it to negative 55. There's no difference once those voltage gated sodium channels open, This it, it's gonna be exactly the same whether the stimulus was bringing it to threshold or bringing it above threshold. Um, so this right here, as you can see, this would be a super threshold, but it's gonna cause the same action potential as just a regular threshold. Sub threshold, you're not getting anything, right? Um, the last thing is this refractory period. And this has to do with those gates on the voltage gated uh, sodium channels. So absolute refractory period, um, all of the sodium gates are inactivated or closed. And therefore sodium cannot get in through those voltage gated um, sodium channels. So there will be no second depolarization during that period. The relative refractory period is uh, the sodium gates um, are closed, uh, but some are starting to open. So some of the gates are opening. And so if you get a strong enough stimulus to go from a hyperpolarized up to threshold, um, 
you can open those gates. So this is why it looks kind of odd, this thing right here. But if you follow me, the strength of the stimulus required, that's how much neurotransmitter, we'll just say it's gonna be the stimulus in this, um, in this example. How much neurotransmitter needs to be released to open how many ligand gated sodium channels? Well, during this period, the sodium um, gated channel is closed. Gate is closed. So if the gate's closed, nothing's happening. That's why nothing's happening right here. So this is time. So during this time period, there's no way to have a second action potential. That's why it says no stimulus re regardless. But at this point, some of the gates are opening. Some gates open. And so as time goes on, more gates open. Uh, and then by the time you get here, all gates are open. in this time period. So what that means is you can have, uh, the stimulus here has to be pretty strong because only a few gates are open, but as time goes on, the stimulus can be normal because all the gates are open. And so um, that's the refractory period. Um, the, the refractory period allows for a certain frequency of action potentials to occur. Um, and because there's a, an absolute refractory period, uh, you can have uh, a frequency of action potential, but they can't be on top of one another. They can't be like continuous. So there is gonna be a little pause. So this would be an action potential. And then that's another action potential. And that's another action potential and so on. So there's a little pause between them. And the frequency of action potentials are important because it lets the brain know how intense the stimulus is. So it lets your brain know the difference between um, something just pressing on you or someone really pushing um, down on you hard. It lets you know um, a little pain from a lot of pain. Because if you have something stab into you and the knife's still in there, you're gonna have an absolute high frequency of action potentials being generated. But if you just get poked, and the knife comes out really quickly, you're gonna have a lower frequency of action potential. So it's how many action potentials are arriving to your brain that lets your brain know how intense the stimulus is. And so that's, that's really the only way your brain can decide how strong or effective something is on you. Um, again, myelination helps the action potential go quickly. The more myelin myelinated, the faster, and so please read through these slides. Speed of conduction, um, and that's it for chapter seven.